So I, I thought I would begin uh, with uh, some broad reflections on this moment that, that we're living through and then connect that to the original focus of the talk and of my work and advocacy around reimagining technology, health, and society. Um, I'll begin with a recent essay by one of my favorite writers and thinkers, Arundhati Roy. It's titled, The Pandemic is a Portal. In it, she writes, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their worlds anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. This image in particular, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, and dead ideas really resonates with me. I see us moving through this portal as individuals, communities, institutions, and at all of these le levels, we have the opportunity to either drag outmoded ways of thinking and doing things with us, or we can begin to imagine and craft a world that is more habitable, more just and joyful. To do this though, I think we have to reckon honestly with what we've actually been carrying and holding on to so that we can even begin to let it go. Because otherwise what is sure to happen is that many dead ideas will be repackaged as new and innovative for the problems we face. So when we think of tech solutions in particular, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching a documentary called The Great Hack, which everyone should watch, by the way. And there's this moment when the narrator is explaining the goal of those who use fake news and digital propaganda to manipulate the public and sow divisions even deeper. The aim of these disinformation architects is explicitly to break society. According to Steve Bannon, for example, it is only when you break society that you can remodel the pieces into your vision of a new society. Now their new vision is nothing new, just more white supremacy, more class warfare, more patriarchy, more imperialism. And to get more, they need to break or continue to break the social contract by deepening divisions and amplifying hierarchies using what is better termed anti-social media. The point being there are powerful people and organizations working overtime to undermine the very premise of this thing we take for granted called society, utilizing the very tools of AI and machine learning to further fracture and stratify the body politic. How then should we think about our work in the context of health research when there's a deliberate campaign to break the social? For starters, I think it means thinking about our work no matter what field we're in beyond our specific job titles and credentials entails a keen understanding that many of the policies and structures that govern our lives are working directly against the social, pushing a corrosive individualism cloaked in the language of freedom. This was true before the pandemic, of course, and has only intensified since. In all of our work, we can and should resist this corrosive individualism that infects every area of our lives. We should challenge the distortion of freedom talk, which is really just the freedom to go to work without sick leave the freedom to nurse the ailing without personal protective equipment, the freedom to grow the nation's food with the looming threat of ice raids, the freedom to be warehoused in prisons with no way to socially distance, the freedom not to care as the most vulnerable die off. The aim of this strain of freedom, a freedom from mutual obligation is to break society to erode mutuality, 
to grind down our ability to care for one another, to eat away at any notion of a collective good, and to destroy the institutions upon which our society depends, including the distortions enabled by scientific and medical experts. Consider the headline. NYPD chief surgeon determined Officer Daniel Pantaleo did not put Eric Garner in a chokehold. The surgeon, Dr. Eli Kleinman, concluded that no, there are no injuries associated with a chokehold and that Garner's pre-existing poor health contributed to his death. We've heard this language before, this language of pre-existing or underlying poor health. Again, we heard it in the coroner's autopsy report of George Floyd. The autopsy revealed no physical findings that support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxia or strangulation. Mr. Floyd had, quote, underlying health conditions, including coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease, end quote. Floyd's family was forced to hire experts to issue an independent autopsy that concluded his death was indeed the result of suffocation. But not only that, they learned that Floyd, who had lost his job as a result of the pandemic and who was allegedly using a counterfeit $20 bill at the time the police were called, had also previously tested positive for COVID. Threat upon threat upon threat, converging pandemics. But whether black people die at the hands of police or as a result of the pandemic or from deadly policies, pre-existing conditions of individuals, that is a corrosive individualism, rather than the sickening conditions of this society are a ready and predictable alibi for the powers that be. It is what some of my colleagues have rightly termed structural gaslighting. If you haven't yet read this article from June 6th, I would highly recommend. It's in Scientific, a Scientific American. The point is that the medical establishment has not simply been a bystander, but has aided and abetted explicit and implicit forms of racism, in part by creating scientific sounding alibis for those who perpetuate more obvious harms. Indeed, I want to propose that there are at least two medical traditions, the one enabling and the other opposing racist violence. The first exemplified by Kleinman's testimony entails the historic and ongoing collusion of scientists and doctors with the powers that be performing sterilizations in U.S. prisons, enabling torture at Guantanamo, not to mention the everyday neglect and mistreatment of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, disabled, femme, poor, trans, imprisoned, veteran, homeless, undocumented, and other vulnerable patients. This tradition, let's call it medicine as objective oppressor, was also responsible for building the intellectual foundation of scientific racism and mobilizing foot soldiers for eugenic policies around the world. But most importantly, this is not the only tradition. There is also a tradition of medical practitioners, health researchers, as not only healers, but truth tellers, whistleblowers, conscientious objectors, witnesses, community partners, and more. Those who use their status and authority to challenge the powers that be. Here we find people who are striving to understand and address the sociopolitical determinants of health, developing what my colleagues Helena Hansen and Jonathan Metzl term structural competency, and who shine a light on medical abuse and neglect in their own backyards including Dr. Hana Atisha. We might call this tradition medicine as a moral force. And while there are many individuals right here, uh, you know, in our, all, in our own backyards and all over the world who carry this tradition forward, organizations like 
white coats for black lives exemplify a collective approach to transforming medical institutions and pedagogy. This is an organization, of course, of medical students that, in their words, was born in response to apathy. While people were mourning the deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garner and were enraged by the non-indictments of the officers who killed them, the medical institution, which has historically had racism built into its foundation, largely remained silent. In December 2014, medical students of color and allies across the country participated in die-ins to honor these individuals and demonstrate a commitment to dismantling the systems that led to their deaths. The actions of these students raise an important question to the institution of medicine. Are medical professionals responsible for combating racism, they ask, for these students? who found themselves committed to a profession that has vowed to support the well-being of all patients and has consistently broken that promise? The answer was an emphatic yes. Their work and others compel us to widen our lens away from simply ailing bodies to an ailing body politic. Not only must we diagnose the deadly nature of everyday racism, but really consider why it persists. Conceptually, there are at least two powerful ideas, I think, that underwrite the second tradition, medicine as a moral force. The one structural competency, which I've mentioned, uh, coined by Hansen and Metzl. The other cultural humility, which I first learned about, about when I lived in the Bay Area from Mel Dr. Melanie Turvalon. Um, so, I'd like us to put a pin in the, these particular concepts, many of which you may, you may already be, be familiar with, um, and think about how, whether they are a required part of the training of health researchers and medical practitioners, and if not, why not? So for now, I wanna move a little bit away from the conceptual to the concrete, moving from lab bench to park bench, as a way to think about how inequity persists how it's designed into the things we take for granted, whether we're talking about curricula or research protocol, all of the everyday workaday aspects of scientific and health research. So here you have in front of you a, a, just a park bench, a bench that's located in Berkeley, California, which is where I went to grad school. And this particular time when I took this picture, I was already living in Boston and, and working there, and it was February on this visit. So... I wanted to soak in the sun for a few minutes between meetings. And I realized very quickly that I actually couldn't lay down comfortably on the bench because of the way it had been designed. Now, you know, there's many functional reasons, you know, uh, why those armrests might have been built in there. Of course, it, uh, you know, provides a, a comfortable way to get up and down. When I was nine months pregnant, it could have helped. An elderly person could help go getting up and down. Um, if someone is sitting there, a stranger, you might be more likely to sit down and that kind of air wall providing some semblance of privacy, all kinds of functional reasons. But of course, I was thinking there might be more going on. And of course, this is the Bay Area where the tech boom has gone how, uh, hand in hand with a dramatic housing crisis. So I thought perhaps the business owners right around here, the cute boutiques right in front may welcome a design uh, intervention that prevents people from sleeping on the benches. And, and at first I thought, okay, Ruha, you're being a little paranoid, but then I did a little digging and found single occupancy benches in Helsinki, so no laying down there. I found caged benches in France, in this town, the mayor put them out on Christmas Eve, and within 24 hours, the people in the town rallied to have them removed as they were so appalled which is a footnote to the larger discussion that we don't simply have to submit or live with what I term discriminatory forms of design or, or coded inequity it, that's designed into whether public space or public policies. We can work together to have things removed and you know, create a world which reflects our values. But my favorite example of discriminatory design, of course, is the spiked bench which you need to pay in order to uh, have the spikes retreat, a kind of metering 
of the space. And you'll be happy to know, initially, this was designed by a German artist to get people thinking critically about the metering of public life more broadly, whether it has to do with our educational system, our healthcare system, the fact that something can be nominally for everyone, but precisely because of the way we design it, it has built-in harms or forms of neglect. The metered bench also gets us thinking about how we create technical fixes for much larger social problems. In this case, we think about homelessness as a matter of problem people. And if we can get those problem people out of sight and out of mind with something like a spiked bench, then we've solved the problem rather than addressing why are people houseless to begin with. And so in ma many times technical fixes has a way of delaying actually a, a thoroughgoing treatment of the underlying problems. The larger question for us, relating it to the work in health research, is what are the forms of spikes that, that shape our, our digital and physical infrastructure? What are the spikes that are built into the policies, the curricula, the protocol? For many of us, we don't necessarily put the spikes in, but we inherit the spikes. So we start a new position or a new role or job and someone hands us the way things have always been done and in so doing, hand, up, hand us on the spike. So the question is, what do we do when we inherit particular ways of doing things and thinking about things that have these harms built into them or forms of neglect built into them? So this is a question to which we'll return. For now, let me offer three takeaways for the, the, the reflections overall. Um, the first is that racism is productive. Racism and interlocking systems, whether classism or sexism, they are productive, not in the sense of being good, of course, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. Because many of us are still thought taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, forward-looking, even viral. In my field of sociology, we often say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I'd like us to think about the way that race and technology shape one another. Because again, more and more people are accustomed to thinking about the ethical and social impacts of technology. But that's only half of the story because social norms, values, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impacts which we need to be concerned about, but the inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that many people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. So one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, safety, and social control. Racism, among other axes of domination, helps to produce this fragmented imagination where we have misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded in justice and joy, we can't only critique the underside, but we also have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desire even for social domination. So those are the three takeaways. Now I'm going to offer a few more concrete examples 
first initially outside of the context of healthcare and health research. And I'd like you to think about their relevance or application to your own context. Let's uh, begin with a relatively new app called Citizen, which will send you real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on purported crimes via the app. And it shows you incidents as red dots on a map so you can avoid supposedly dangerous neighborhoods. So some of you are already thinking, what could possibly go wrong in the age of barbecue Beckys who call the police on black people cooking, walking, breathing, bird watching out of place? It turns out that even a Stanford educated environmental scientist living in the Bay Area pictured here is an ambassador of the carceral state calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt in Oakland. It's worth noting, too, that the app Citizen was originally called the less chill name Vigilante. And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to avoid it. What's most important to our discussion, I think, is that Citizen and other tech fixes for social problems are not simply about technology's impact on society, but also about how social norms and values shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. So how should we understand this duplicity of tech fixes, purported solutions that nevertheless have the potential to reinforce or deepen existing hierarchies? One formulation that was hard to miss a few years ago was this idea of racist robots. There were a first wave of stories that seemed to be shocked at the prospect that artifacts have politics. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override and address the default settings of racist and sexist robots for better or worse. And here robots is a heuristic for thinking about automation and, and emerging technologies more broadly. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are used to differentiate us. This combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I've termed the new gym code, innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. This riff off of Michelle Alexander's analysis in The New Jim Crow considers how the reproduction of racist forms of social control in successive institutional forms contains a crucial socio-technical component that not only hides the nature of domination, but allows it to penetrate every area of our lives under the guise of progress. A quick example of the new Jim Code from this past fall, racial bias in a medical algorithm favors white patients over sicker black patients, reports Obermeyer and colleagues, in which the researchers were actually able to look inside the black box of algorithm design, which is typically not possible with proprietary systems. What's especially important to note is that the algorithm does not explicitly take note of race. That is to say, it is race neutral. By using cost to predict healthcare need, this digital triaging system unwittingly reproduces racial disparities because on average, black people incur fewer costs for a variety of reasons, including systemic racism. In my review of the study by Obermeyer and colleagues, both of which you can download from science if you haven't already read it or the research tab of my website, I argue that indifference to social reality on the part of tech designers and adopters can be even more harmful than malicious intent. In the case of this widely used healthcare algorithm affecting millions of people, more than double the number of black patients would have been enrolled in programs designed to help them stay out of the hospital had it actually been based on need rather than cost. So race neutrality can be a deadly force. As I get you then to consider the other ways where that anti-blackness gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems, 
I offer four conceptual offspring to the new gym code that fall along a kind of spectrum from the most obvious to the more insidious. We start with engineered inequity, which are those technologies that explicitly uh, seek to amplify social cleavages. They're what we might think of as the most obvious, less hidden dimension of the new gym code. But even they typically come wrapped in the packaging of progress. So the idea is usually that for some people to move forward, others must be contained. Default discrimination are those inventions that tend to ignore social uh, cleavages and as such tend to reproduce the default settings of race, class, and gender. Coded exposure examines the way that some technologies fail to see racial difference while others render racialized people hypervisible and exposed to systems of surveillance, including health surveillance. And finally, techno-benevolence names those tech developments that claim to address bias of various sorts, but may still manage to reproduce or deepen discrimination, in part because of the narrow way in which fairness is defined and operationalized. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to sketch the last two um, and give you just a little more, uh, add a little more flesh to the concept. So as I said, coded exposure names that tension between ongoing surveillance of racialized populations and then calls for digital recognition and inclusion, the desire to literally be seen by technology. So here, for example, we see the little camera on our phones and computer screens that many of which up until very recently especially have had a harder time detecting people with darker skin. What I'd like to underscore, though, is that it's not only in the process of being out of sight, but also in the danger of being too centered that racialized groups are made vulnerable. So that being seen is not simply positive recognition, but can be a form of unwanted exposure, or what some of my colleagues call predatory inclusion, which is something I think that we have to think about um, in the context of, of this conversation, and especially during um, the pandemic. Um, enrolling underserved populations in various trials, for example. So at this point, I would normally show a wonderful clip from the show Better Off Ted to illustrate one half of this equation, that is the process of being out of sight. Um, in the show, which takes place in a pharmaceutical company, um, the company installs sensors all around the building. But again, they don't detect darker skin. So all of the black employees have a hard time opening doors, using water fountains, using the elevator. And so as a solution, the company installs manual water fountains, for example, which recalls, again, the era of, of Jim Crow. And so there's an interesting interplay between um, old forms of segregation being the solution to emerging forms of automation and sensory detection. What I like about the clip is that it shows how a superficial corporate diversity ethos, the prioritization of efficiency over equity, and the default whiteness of tech development work together to ensure that innovation literally produces containment. The fact that darker skin employees cannot use so many of the facilities is treated as a minor inconvenience in service to a greater good. But good for whom, we should always ask. And there's one moment that's especially relevant to our conversation where one, the, one of the CEOs, she says that it's not racism because we're not targeting black people, we're just ignoring them. And so indifference is seen as somehow different from racism, but I think we need to fold that into our conversation. Finally, some of the most interesting developments, I think, are those we can consider techno-benevolence, which aim to address bias of various sorts. Take, for example, new AI techniques for vetting job applicants. There's a company called HireVue that's one of many that aims to reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using an AI-powered program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. It uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues like facial expression, posture, vocal tone. And then what it does is it compares job seekers scores to those of existing top performing employees to decide 
who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. The sheer size of many applicant pools and the amount of time and money that at companies pour into recruitment is astronomical. So companies like HireVue step into the mix and narrow the eligible pool at a fraction of the time and cost. And hundreds and hundreds of companies worldwide have signed on, everyone from Goldman Sachs to Vodafone to the Atlantic Public School Systems and more. According to HireVue, there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make, quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented, so the logic goes, wouldn't this be even more reason to outsource decisions to AI? Well, consider a study by Princeton team of computer scientists that examined whether a popular algorithm trained on human writing online exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white sounding names with pleasant words and black sounding names with unpleasant ones. So too with gender coded words and names as Amazon learned a few years ago when its own hiring algorithm was found discriminating against women. Nevertheless, it should be clear why technical fixes that claim to bypass human biases are so desirable. If only there was a way to slay centuries of racist and sexist demons with a social justice bot. Beyond desirable, more like magical. Magical for employers, perhaps looking to streamline the grueling work of recruitment, but a curse for many job seekers. As this headline put it, your next interview could be with a racist bot, bringing us back to the problem space we started with. Though it's worth noting that some job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as informal audits of their own. In fact, one HR employee for a major company recommends slipping the words Oxford or Cambridge into our CVs with invisible white text to pass the automated screening. In terms of a more collective response, a federation of European trade unions called UNI Global has developed a charter of digital rights for workers, touching on automated and AI-based decisions to be included in bargaining agreements. Another promising development amidst the daily barrage of catastrophic headlines is that tech workers themselves have increasingly been speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism. For example, thousands of Google employees condemned the company's collaboration on a Pentagon program that uses AI to make drone strikes more effective. And a growing number of Microsoft employees are opposed to the company's ICE contract, saying that, quote, as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. And as this article published by Science for the People reminds us, contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, individualism, and reformism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which, like White Coats for Black Lives, includes students across our many institutions who can draw from past organizers' experiences in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech or medicine or academia, and which includes building solidarity across class and race. In terms of civil society, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Tech Project offer a far more a, a more far-reaching approach, and there are many, many other kind of tech justice organizations at the local, regional, national, and international level that we can learn from and contribute to. And finally, when it comes to rethinking STEM education and I would say medical education as well as a ground zero for reimagining the relationship between technical expertise and social and historical expertise, there are a number of initiatives underway. One concrete resource that you can download as you consider similar efforts to reform the way that race and racism are addressed in health research is the Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech Handbook, developed by some wonderful colleagues at the Data and Society Research Institute. The aims of this intervention is threefold to develop um, an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed, an emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful situations within organizations, 
and a commitment to take action to reduce harms to communities of color. To that end, the late legal and critical race scholar Derek A. Bell encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals, insisting that to see things as they really are, we have to imagine them as they might be. One of my favorite examples then of what we might call a bellion racial reversal, bringing us back to that citizen app that we talked about early on, is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-Black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but it includes an app that alerts users when they've entered high risk areas to encourage citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition system to flag likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design the algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. Not surprisingly, the average face of a so-called criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical when we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. In health research, what would it look like to turn the lens back onto those who are producing health risk rather than simply to predict, predict riskiness? By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this manner, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by technology. So here's my final proposition. If it is the case that inequity and injustice is woven into the very fabric of society, then each twist, coil, and code is really a chance for us to weave new patterns, practices, and politics. The vastness of the problems that we're up against will be their undoing once we accept that we are pattern makers. So now what? For starters, I encourage you to identify the kinds of coded inequity, not only in the health outcomes, but in the processes that produce those outcomes, what happens behind the scenes. I encourage you to imagine new patterns of thought and action focusing on the nitty gritty, not grand gestures and announcements about diversity and inclusion, but looking at the fine print. And I encourage you to, to work with others, to organize, to remove the spikes and enact just alternatives. With that, I um, open it up for conversation and discussion. Thank you.